trying to decide earlier if it was too hot or not to wear this coat. I'm going to try it. We'll see how I end up. Welcome, everybody. If you're visiting here today, we appreciate having you here. I'd like to remind, I know those of you who are members here, uh, you remember that last uh, year we had Jordan Schaus here, and we talked a lot about Joseph in that meeting. And so I'd like to remind you of one of the stories that we talked about there. I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to trust your memory of the story. But remember Joseph when he was sold into slavery and finally ended up in Potiphar's house and he rose to the head of the house and Potiphar's wife wanted Joseph to commit adultery with her. And she every day pressed him, pressed him, pressed him until finally one day he ran left his robe in her, in her hand where she was holding on to him, and he ran away from that, knowing that that sin would be one that not only would be against Potiphar, but more importantly, it would be against God. And I want you to, as you think about that story, ask yourself, what was it that caused Joseph to make that choice at that instant in time? To say no every time, and then to ultimately, when pressed hard by her, to run. Now I want you to think about a second story. David and Bathsheba, as you know, we're studying through David this year, and I'm not going to go through the whole, all the details of the story, but there's an important part of this story I want us to think about. If you're Bible students, you know the general story. David is on his roof one night, looking down, and he sees through a window a woman taking a bath, and he finds her beautiful. He makes his first mistake when he does a bad, makes a bad decision and inquires about who she is, and sets up a meeting. And that meeting leads them to commit adultery because she's a married woman, married to one of his mighty warriors. Seems like this is a one-time event, but no. She sends word after a period of time that she is pregnant. Now he's got a problem. It's gonna be found out what he did. So you know what happens. He brings in her husband from the battlefield to try to set up a situation where he has some doubt as to, did he do this, or did, well, is she pregnant with her own with her child from her husband? Uriah, being a warrior, says, I'm not going into my wife. My buddies are out in battle, and he refuses to go. And so David, in order to cover this up, ultimately has Uriah put in a position in battle where his compadres pull away from him, and he's killed in battle. Soon thereafter, David marries Bathsheba, and she's found to be pregnant, and it all appears to be on the up and up that he was simply comforting the wife of a fallen warrior and taking her into his house. But you know what happens next, right? The prophet Nathan comes. I just want to read this portion of 2 Samuel 12. I want you to think about what the prophet Nathan is doing to try to shake David out of this pathway of sin that he's been on. And the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came and said to him, There were two men in a certain city. The one was rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and he grew it up with him and his children. It used to eat his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come for him, but he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Okay, this story is told to the man David who had committed sin after sin after sin after sin with no apparent remorse that we can see. That we don't see any of that remorse. I mean, this is the same David who wrote in Psalms 12, verse 1 and 2, O Lord, the godly one is gone. The faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbors. With flattering lips do they speak. David observed that earlier in his life, and now he was the one who was the liar, the one with flattering lips, the one covering up sin. He was exactly the person he was reading about before. This man was far gone down the path of sin. Interestingly, this story sent David into a rage. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, verse 5. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this, stolen this little ewe lamb, deserves to die. 
He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Well, here's some good news. David was able to discern something that was right and wrong at this point in his life. This story, it was a huge wrong to him. Have you ever thought about what David was before he was king and warrior? He was a shepherd. He gets told a story of a, a stolen pet sheep, stolen pet lamb. You think David might have had a pet lamb when he was a small shepherd boy, that he knew what it was like to have an affection for the lamb? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But now, Nathan, when he has David enraged and finally showing he has some ability to discern right from wrong, says, verse 7, you're the man. You are the man. And then he goes on to expose everything that David had done up until that point. Now the question for David at this point is, is he going to keep down the pathway he's been on of sinning after sinning after sinning after sinning? Because one of the things he could do as king is just have this man killed. It's a lie. He can't prove any of this thing. Let's just throw him away. So David has a choice to make right here in the face of this story. And how does David choose? Verse 12, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. What caused David at that point in time to finally recognize his sin and finally do, take the next step that he had to take in order to get rid of that sin, to repent to the Lord? What caused him to do that? And what's the common thread between David and, jo and Joseph? I would offer to you that the same thing was active in both of their lives except at different points along this timeline of sin, and that is their conscience. Their conscience was active. For Joseph, his conscience was active before he sinned when he was presented with temptation. Genesis 39, 9, he said to Potiphar's wife, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph knew that this would be a sin. And Joseph came from a really bad family situation. I mean, Jacob's family was not the best family in the world um, for doing the right thing. A lot of stuff happened in that house. But Joseph somehow in his life knew that it would be sinful for him to lie with another man's wife. Now, he refused to do it. His conscience was telling him don't do it, and he didn't do it. For David... It's a whole different situation. He ran over his conscience the first time, and the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time. And it wasn't until this story of the lamb that stirred him up and made him understand, I have done wrong. It doesn't matter that I'm the king and, do what, and I can do whatever I want to do. I have done wrong before God, and I have to repent of this. It wasn't until that point in his life his conscience actually pushed him hard enough to do the right next thing to do. Where did that conscience come from? We read a lot of David's writings earlier on. We see his relationship with the Lord. We even know this is the man who, who said when to Saul when it was time to, to go out and fight Goliath, he said, I can fight Goliath because I've killed a bear, I've killed a lion attacking my flock. So I can do this with God's help. And yet later on in life he forgot all about God's help and about his relationship to God. How did the conscience motivate these two men and what can we learn for our lives that helps us when we face the situations that they faced? Temptation and the situation where we know we've sinned. And we have the choice of to go keep going down that path or take care of it when we know about that. What is the conscience? And how does it work inside of our lives? Now, this is a deep subject, and in the, at most 20 minutes I've got less, we can't go the full depth that's here. This probably could have been a series, but I can't make it a series today. So let's keep it simple and practical to see what we can learn about the conscience. Literally, the word conscience in the English language comes from a Latin word that means con, which is with or together, and science, which is to know. It basically means to know together with yourself, as if you're two people, that you know something together. And the Greek word 
that's used in the New Testament for conscience is exactly the same, the same kind of meaning. But I think Thayer in his definition puts the biblical context for conscience in place. Conscience is a quality of the soul as distinguishing between what is morally good and bad and prompting you to do the good while shunning away from the bad and commending within yourself the good and condemning bad. Okay, so what, what does that mean? I'm not going to unpack it because you know what conscience is, right? You have one. It's taught to you, right? You've heard your conscience. In fact, later on, David did something else which was sinful, and this phrase was used when David came to his senses in that case when he had numbered the people when he should not have numbered the people, which was against God's word. And when he finally recognized he violated God's word, it said, David's heart struck him. I just want us to pull that phrase out. Has your heart ever struck you? That's what conscience is doing. All of a sudden you realize I'm doing something wrong. Or better yet, I'm being asked to do something wrong and I'm not going to go do that. That's what conscience is. When you've sinned, I'm sure your conscience talked. When I've sinned, I know my conscience has talked. Conscience is a guide, and that's what this picture is. It's not the pictures you see with conscience where there's a devil sitting on one side and, the, and an angel sitting on the other side whispering in your ear. No. Conscience is actually a guide that is within you. And we're going to talk a little bit about what is that guide and how is that guide a proper guide in the rest of the lesson here. But the Bible plainly teaches that you and I have to follow our conscience. James, the fourth chapter, verse 17 Whoever, to know, whoever knows to do good but, does, but fails to do it, for him it is sin. If there's something your conscience is telling you that's good to do, that's right to do, and you don't do it, that's sin. Guilt comes when we sin. And if we sin against our conscience, we will feel that guilt and that our conscience will want to be restored so it doesn't have that guilt. After this incident with Bathsheba, David wrote in Psalms 51, verse 3, I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Have you had any of those nights where your sin was ever before you? I have. He writes a whole psalm later. His, his lamentation of his own sin with Bathsheba and his repentance to God. And when you read that whole Psalm 51, you recognize this is a man who's hurting, who knows he's done wrong, and he wants that hurt to go away, and he knows only God can help him take that away. Think about when Peter preached the Pentecost sermon, and he ended up that sermon by, by saying, you, to all those people gathered, are the ones who killed Jesus, who God has made Lord in Christ. What happened in Mass when he said that? When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Their conscience kicked in. They realized now that what they had done that they thought was right was totally wrong. And their conscience said, we, we got to take care of this. And so what's the next thing that they ask? This is, the, I believe, the conscience operating. What must we do? Brothers, what must we do? We have sinned. What can we do? The conscience prompted them to seek a solution for the sin that they saw in their life. It is the conscience that works inside of us second by second, minute by minute, day by day to try to prevent us from doing things that we know are wrong and try to encourage us to do things that we know are right. And it is the conscience that when we sin, if we let it be active, will keep calling us to take care of that sin. So it's important. And in fact, there's a word that the New Testament uses about a conscience that is functioning correctly. Simple word, it's a good conscience. If we have a good conscience in the sense of the, how the New Testament talks about it, we have a conscience that's, that's active. In 1 Timothy, and Paul to Timothy talks about conscience a lot, which is interesting to this young preacher, but he says in the 5th in the, uh, and 6th verses, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving away from these, have wandered away. 
Yes, you can wander away from the faith. Yes, you can wander away from purity. And yes, you can wander away from your conscience. He says later on, a few verses down, to him that Timothy needs to hold faith and have a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Run over your conscience, you'll make shipwreck of your faith. A good conscience, one that is active and that is not condemning you, is certainly a huge part of us being a Christian. Peter says it this way, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that's within you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. Isn't that what... Joseph did? Didn't he tell Potiphar's wife, I can't sin against the Lord? He had a faith that he was willing to, to save, and that faith made him make the right decision. He, he listened to his conscience and, 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 and did do that. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. Listen to that. Peter puts it this way. Baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A conscience that recognizes that it's sinned, and if you're not a Christian, pay attention here. When you've recognized that you're sinned, your conscience knows that that sin doesn't go away. Just because you try to forget it, just because you try to cover it over, just because you just walk away from it. Baptism is appeal to God to give me back my good conscience. Let, it, let my conscience say, now you're in step with doing what's right because you've obeyed God in doing what's right. Hebrews. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Jesus' blood is the only thing able to purify our conscience. And whether we're this morning sitting here not a Christian, or if we are a Christian and we have sin in our lives, contacting the blood of Jesus is the only way our conscience will truly be pure and now will be truly aligned with God and aligned within ourselves and stop telling us that you've done wrong. You need to do something about it. So a good conscience is absolutely imperative. But... Sometimes we don't listen to our conscience, right? Sometimes we let things go. We've done something wrong, we just let them go. The Bible has a term for the pathway that leads to ignoring your conscience, and it's the pathway David was clearly on, and that is a seared conscience. To the pure, all things are pure, Titus 1, verse 15, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. When the conscience isn't working right, when it's saying, you know, Greg, this is the wrong thing to do, and I do it anyway, I've defiled my conscience there. I've not only sinned, I've made my conscience a little less effective because next time when it tries to tell me that, it was a lot easier for me to say, no, I really want to do this instead. And we keep going. And that's where David was. He went down that path. Fortunately, David didn't make it to the end of the path, but we can. The Spirit expressly says, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2, that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. There were people who would be teaching in the church falsehoods, trying to pull other people down that path. And why were they doing what was obviously wrong? Their consciences were gone. They were seared. So we can take a good conscience and we can turn it into a totally ineffective conscience by ignoring it. Well, our conscience is a moral guide. Where does that morality come from that's in our conscience? Does it just get planted there? Does God, and there, this is deep, I'm not going to go into this. I actually think the way we can rely upon having a good conscience that is also telling us 
the right thing to do, and it is the right thing to do, is when we have an informed conscience. Our conscience needs to be trained in what is right and what is wrong. Sometimes we're doing something that we think is right and it's not. And I know this is the case because a very prominent man that we're studying from his writings right now had that problem. Paul. When Paul was arrested in the temple, he was brought before the Sanhedrin council. And when he stood up the Sanhedrin council, it says he looked intently at the council and Paul said, brothers, I've lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. He was next taken to Felix, and he said to Felix, I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward God and man. Then to Agrippa, he, re he reveal, excuse me, reveals to us something very insightful that we need to pay attention to. Acts 26, verse 9 through 11. I myself was convinced that I ought to do things opposing the name of Jesus. So I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them in synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme, and raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul did that, and he also said, while I was doing that, I did that in all good conscience. Was he right? No. No. But do you have a good conscience about it? He thought he was, he said, I was convinced. So guess what? You and I can convince our conscience of something that's wrong. And we can follow it, and our conscience is working perfectly fine. It's working on the wrong information. Now, did God just leave him in that state? A man with a good conscience who was willing to act on his conscience? I actually believe this is our hope that we don't have the, the condition where we'll just remain with a good conscience and totally misinformed. What did God do next for Paul? He got him informed, right? Didn't Peter see him on the road? I mean, didn't Jesus see him on the road to Damascus? Didn't Paul agonize for three days before he was ultimately baptized to restore his conscience? And didn't he retrain himself over three years when he was away and doing that? All those things were a part of Paul throwing off what he thought was right about his acts under the law as a, as a Jew and putting on Christ so he could actually do the right thing. But he did that the entire time in all good conscience. Imagine if Joseph would have said, you know, I'm in Egypt. They don't, they don't mind adultery. I can do it here. My, my gods are back in Israel. How would that story have turned out? What if David said, and he, did, he said this to himself, I think, over and over. I'm king. I can do whatever I want. I can have whoever I want. How that story turned out if that wouldn't have been turned around, if he actually believed that lie? You and I have to be careful that we don't have a conscience prompting us to do things that are actually lies, which means we have to look to make sure our conscience stays constantly informed. It's not just good enough to follow your conscience. People will say that. Just follow your conscience, you'll be fine. Well, it didn't work out well for Paul until he was presented with a new choice. Fortunately, his conscience prompted him to make the correct choice in that case. We have to do the same. My conscience and your conscience is important. It has to be a good conscience. It has to be an active conscience. It has to be one which directs us based upon what it knows. The minute we run over our conscience, the minute we just go ahead and do it anyway, it's a small thing or I can get away with it, you hurt it. And the next time you do it, you hurt it more. And it gets more and more wounded and it gets more and more unuseful to you. And when it's seared, and think about that word seared. What if you put your hand on a hot fire after the pain of that is gone and the scar is only left there, are you going to feel out of that hand anymore? It's not going to work well. That's what the conscience is. And our conscience has to be informed. Okay, well that's an interesting study, so let's talk about the so what about this. And I've got just three so what's here to, 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 finish, to finish the lessons. And, and, and I would, would ask you, think about this seriously. Think about this right now. Is your conscience telling you there's something unresolved in your life you need to resolve? Are you listening? 
What action do you need to take? If your conscience is telling you it's, it's unresolved and you don't know what to do, you can get informed in what to do. Think about what David was forgiven of. Think about what Paul was forgiven of. Listen to your conscience. Don't let it, don't suppress it. You know, you have a world that's around you saying, oh, you need to forgive yourself when you feel guilty. It causes negative things in your life when you feel guilty. Well, if God's forgiven you, that's true. But if God hasn't forgiven you, that guilt serves a very useful function in prompting you to actually come to do the right thing. How many people have ruined their lives trying to get rid of their guilt by abusing alcohol, by abusing legal and illegal drugs, by going to people who tell them, you're just, you're just following old ways, you need to get in the modern world and forgive yourself. If you're here in this building, your conscience has been trained with better training than that. You know better from the Word of God that if there's something in your life that needs to be taken care of, if you're a Christian or if you're not a Christian, there's a way to do that. If your conscience is talking to you today. Listen and act. Don't run over it. Because if you run over it, you may walk out of this building today with your conscience burned a little bit more, a tiny bit more seared, less active, less able to help you. Secondly, you and I need to constantly be trying to inform ourselves of what God's Word says for us so that we can be assured that when our conscience is directing us, it's directing us to the right standard. If, if you have Google Maps out and you put the wrong destination in, you can follow Google Maps perfectly. Are you going to get to the right destination? No. Our conscience is kind of like Google Maps in that case. It's telling us, well, if you're going here, you should turn this or that or this or that. But is here the right place to go? Should we be going there? God's Word tells us which way we're going, where our destination is. Then if our conscience is aligned on that, it can help us. It can help us when we're not here in the services where there's somebody around to encourage us. It can help us when we don't have our Bible to look up the verse and say, should I do this or not? It can help us in all those situations in the active part of our life where we're implementing what we know is right and our conscience is helping us do that if we keep informed. Are we skipping sessions to get our conscience informed? Are we lagging on our reading? Are we lagging on our studying? Are we skipping out on coming to church sometimes? Are we skipping out on preparing for classes and all those kind of things? I know I've been guilty of that. God will try to inform us if we have a good conscience of the right way to go. But he's going to do it through his word. And we have to be open and receptive to that. If we start ignoring that, that's just the first step in having a bad conscience. That's one that now is knowingly not guiding us to the right place. And the last point I've got is a special point for you parents who still have kids at home. You have to do everything in your power while your kids are at home to make sure they have a good conscience. I don't know if it's because Jesse assigned David as the youngest guy to, to, to follow the sheep, that that's why he knew about sheep. But that lamb story rescued David. When your child is away from your house and they're away in the world, and, they're fought, and they've gone down a path of sin, what's deep inside of them that it's, they still retain a sense of right and wrong that can be appealed to by somebody one day, even if they won't listen to you? Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9, we read, the, we read verse 4 a lot because this was the, quest, the answer to the question Jesus gave to the lawyer who said, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Okay. We, that, that's the greatest command. Read the next verses. These words I command you today shall be on your heart. Oh, there's informing your conscience right there. Okay, that's only about two-thirds of the lines on my page. I'm going to read you the rest of that verse. Double the weight is put on what I'm about to read to you next by the writer than 
Just put, put uh, the right things on your own heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. By counting words, it was twice important for them to teach their kids about God as it was to get their own hearts informed about God and to embed in their kids God's Word so that they could one day follow God's Word and if they drifted away from it, they could come back to it. Ephesians 6, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but do what? Bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. How active do you want your, your, your kids' consciences to be? If they're at home right now, it's on you. What are you doing to build inside of them that active conscience. Wasn't the job given to the church? We can help. Wasn't the job given to teachers? Job given to you, and specifically fathers, to see that, that that is done. I pray that one day you don't face finding out that your, your child is down a pathway of sin that seems to not be one that they will come back from. I know there are those of us here who, who face that. I pray that our children, even if they're down that pathway, one day we'll have an interaction that calls back something that they remember that t makes their conscience say, I have got to turn around. Like the prodigal son had that happen. When he finally realized I'm living with pigs because of my lifestyle, I can go home, he went home. That may or may not happen for our children who are down the wrong pathway, but at least they have a chance if we have done the right work to do that. But if we hit this a few minutes at a time, and it's just as important to take them to ball games and to get their schoolwork done as it is to do this, don't be surprised. Do not be surprised. Because I know in my lifetime, I have not seen a world that is more intent on corrupting the minds of our children than it is right now from every angle. You are the defense against that, parents, to make sure that doesn't happen with your kids. And our parents in this, in this audience are doing a great job. But I just can't fail to, to stop what stay away with this. They build that conscience in your children. So, what's your conscience say today? Act on it as we stand and as we sing.